Hey, so before we start this episode, I got a quick question for you. Is there anyone in your life who you think could benefit from what we're doing here, like a friend or a coworker or another SaaS founder? If you've got that person, do us a favor. Just share this podcast with them. Send them a message, put up an Instagram story, tag us on social media and make a post, whatever works for you. But Johnny and I are on a mission to help as many SaaS founders as we can, and it would be incredible if you could support us by helping us spread the word. I'm Johnny Page. I'm Matt Verlek. And this is the SaaS County Podcast. We're back in the mail room. I every time we say that, I imagine Elf. I've, I don't know if I've said that before, but like it's that time <laughs> of year. I imagine before. Elf in the mail room. You know, he's got the whiskey and the coffee cup, and uh, they're having a party down there. So that's what our mail room is like today. We're talking. We got a little bit of everything. We got some developer questions. How to find a 10x dev? We've got how to leverage a Facebook community, whether it's in support or in lead gen. And we've got, what was the last one in the mail room? Not using an EA, man. Ah, uh, yes, using an EA. But before we do that, dude, do you mind if I take a second to brag on one of our SaaS Academy clients? They're wrapping up. They just posted in our, in our client-only Facebook community some wins from 2023. Do you mind if I share? Do a little brag? Dude, I would love for you to share. Let's do it. All right. So Bruce posted, he joined in April of this year. I'm going to give you a little highlight reel of in, what's that, like eight months, all that they accomplished. So first off in April, they, since April, they've reworked their pricing. They implemented the demo on demand, which is kind of near and dear to my heart. Framework I taught in SAS Academy. Love to see they, they implemented that. They simplified their offer and their technical setup. They produced their first ever org chart. Big, big milestone there. Lots of clarity that comes out of that. They wrote their one page strategic plan, built their first funnel and got, uh, were started driving paid traffic to it. And then they've got playbooks for every area of the business. And it all culminated with, they sold their first annual paid in full deal for north of 30K um, to, to cap off the year. So yeah, pretty stellar, stellar year. Congrats, Bruce and team. Um, you know, stoked for you guys and a uh, heck of a way to end off 2023. And you know what it reminds me of? And I don't know the specifics of these guys. Um, one of my favorite sayings though, imperfect plans, violently executed. Like that's the vibe I'm getting, right? Is just, we're just going to get after it. We're going to build a plan. We're going to set up the paid traffic. We're going to do the deal. And it's just like, sometimes you just got to go. Sometimes you just got to get in there and just do the work and the- make massive action and i just i love seeing him in that's a great share yeah yeah i knew i met bruce in april i actually you know met him probably in his first 30 days and i knew they'd be successful like he just had the right mindset default to action and uh dude congrats bruce hell of a year and uh, excited to see what 2024 has got in store with that matt let's uh which one we going to tackle first you want to talk eas you want to talk devs Dude, let's talk EAs, man. I think that that's something that I think you and I both have some solid approaches to. Um, Yeah, this was from Ramesh. And, um, you know, it's interesting because I get this question a lot and I know you do as well. Well, Not just about... Well, let's say the question. Let's let's, let's not get too far down the road. Well, you got got the... uh, You want to cue us up with our message question? Why why are you Why are you yelling at me, bro? I was just about to go through it. You've been You've been on this thing (laughs) recently where you just skip to like you know I don't know G. You just (laughs) just can't keep up, man. You just got to keep up with me, Johnny. All right, okay, all right. Take us where you want. No, what I was going to say is like the question that Ramesh asked, which I'm about to read, is one that you and I have seen us both get asked this in like over and over again in a variety of different areas. And so what he said was. I'm hiring a remote EA for the first time. Like, what should I do around SOPs, training material? Which tasks should I delegate? Calendar, gifting, organizing team events, dinners, like, and and how do you work with them? And so, like, that's a whole that's a whole thing. But kind of on the backside of that, one of the limiting beliefs I've heard from people as well is that they're like, oh, I don't know if I actually have enough to give my EA in order to fill their schedule. I'm not sure if I need one. And so, you know, I think by answering Ramesh's question, we can probably also help a lot of other listeners conquer that limiting belief of like, oh, I don't, I couldn't make use of an executive assistant yet. So I think it might be fun for us to just riff like, 
how do you work with Mia and like what are the SOPs and rhythms that you've installed? I'll go through the same thing with, you know, the way I work with Nicole in my world and let's just lay some groundwork for Ramesh here. Awesome. Um, I love it, man. First off, it is hard. It's can't you like if you haven't worked with an EA yet, it's hard to imagine how you would because you're yeah. so used to your status quo. But I promise you, six months in, if not sooner than that, you're gonna be like, Holy crap. How did I ever work without an EA? That's what so I was going to say. I was going to say the opposite's also true, right? One, if you have worked with an EA, you could never think about how you would ever work without one. Yeah, I mean, you you just it's you just got to trust and have belief in yourself that you are great at creating ROI, that you you are a value creating yeah. person, and that when you get more horsepower, you are going to create more value. And so the how I love, you know, I love that he's settled on, Hey, I've got the person now I'm asking the question on how. So, um, you know, I think I've worked with uh, EA now for, uh, close to two years, um, with almost like 10 years professionally without having an EA. And, uh, again, couldn't imagine, you know, <laughs> prior to that, couldn't imagine having one after yeah. you know that I can't imagine working without it. So, um, some of the rhythms that, uh, first off, my EA has got access to everything, you know, calendar, email, come to any of the meetings. I'll tell you if you're not invited on the rare occasion that like, you know, I need to have a, a private conversation, but that is designed so that it is their responsibility to gain enough context to anticipate the need. It's never like, yeah. well, I didn't know is not a, um, is not an excuse. So you remove that roadblock. And, you know, early on, you're probably syncing on a daily basis, you know, for 30 minutes. And when you're in the process of, so, you know, first layer is delegate the inbox and delegate the calendar, you've got to start to communicate the principles in which you've made those decisions before. So, you know, hey, in my inbox, anything that looks like a newsletter, remove it. You know, it, it's, 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 a, it's starting as elementary as that. And now it's helpful if you hire an EA that has done this before, they'll have, you know, they'll have Hey, normally I would do blank. Can't you okay with, they'll kind of come with a blueprint in place, but if not, then you just start at ground zero and it comes to, it comes down to having really great communication around how have you done this before that person, the EA is a writer downer to use the term we use quite frequently. Like <laughs> their responsibility is to take the communicate, you know, the, the preferences that I've communicated to write them down and to make them into a playbook into a system that happens uh, you know, if we never talk about this again and we come back to it a year from now, it should still be de being done the same way. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I think that's, you know, that's what delegation looks like and it starts in, in the inbox and with in the, on the calendar, just by communicating those principles that, um, you are, that you have and that they can operate by and you have frequent conversations around, you know, feedback and, um, you know, in calibrating how they're working together. But I'll, I'll start there. We can get into like the special projects because I, I think that's, you know, gets into, uh, I don't know, maybe EA, leveraging an EA 201. But 101 is email and calendar. Matt, any thoughts? What do your rhythms look like? Yeah, similar. Um, I'm going to double down on a couple of things that you said. Um, if you have hesitation about Dele fully delegating the inbox and calendar within the first two to three working days that that person is on your team. Either you have some limiting beliefs you need to get over or you're about to hire the wrong person if you can't figure out how to trust them. Like that to me, I'm just plus wanting, if that's a word, um, what you said about that because I can't see a world in which an EA can actually do their job to the level that I know you would expect one to do and that I expect one to do without having full access to all of that context. So like, you know, um, like when Nicole onboarded within 48 hours, she had my work emails, my personal emails, my credit card numbers, like she knew the names of my kids. And, you know, a lot of people say trust is earned. I just don't operate that way. I believe that trust is given. You can certainly lose it, <laughs> but I start with trust and Maybe that opens you up a little bit for some vulnerability and maybe that comes with the territory, but I can't imagine doing it the other way. And so I think that, you know, I've, I've talked with some founders when they're, they're just like, oh, I don't know how to use my EA, but that they don't even give the EA the ammunition to make good decisions in the first place. Yeah. I mean, you, you really have to, like, like many things, it comes down to who you're hiring. Trust yeah. is absolutely critical in this hire. 
you got to yeah. be willing to just like let them all the way literally the more transparent and vulnerable and you know more i communicate that i am with my my ea the better we perform as a as a pair it's like yeah. she is i you know i call it you know she's like the co-founder in this role with me like we are we're working yeah. on it together there's nothing that i'm responsible for that you aren't responsible for and vice versa and you can't do a very good job if you don't have context um so yeah you gotta gotta come into it and, and have that have that trust as a foundation now it is something to grow into i think there's some ways you can build up to it right like we're talking about going and attacking some of the low hanging fruit that will buy back some of your time you get to see some reps like i'm not going to bring in an ea and then have them like rebuild an apartment on day one sure yeah, but yeah like yeah. you know you we work our way up to it but yeah I, I love your frame of like trust is given and then you know loss versus being earned because you know yeah and, and I, I bucket the types of work into, I call it admin work and strategic work, right? So when you say something like rebuild a department or go lead big projects, like that's definitely strategic work that comes a little bit later. But there's the, a lot of founders can't get past the admin side just because it feels so alien to share all your stuff, right? Um, so I think that's definitely the foundation. There's two other things that um, that I would call out on this. The first is something you mentioned, the daily stand-up. Like, the, honestly, like that 30 to 45 minutes that I spend in that call, it's one of, if not the most like high leverage meetings of my day, right? Because it's like literally I have a whole other human being who can go get stuff done on my behalf and stuff that needs to get done. So the 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 higher level of like discipline and rigor that we run that call with the more I can get out of every day, the more we can get out of every day as a team, right? And so I think that like, to me, that's not just an onboarding thing. I don't have a, a single other person, including you, that I work with that I talk to every day. Even you and I don't talk every day, um, but Nicole and I do. Um, and we get a ton out of that call. Um, but the real question there is how to get the most out of that time together. And as the founder, what do you need to overcome to be the person that can get what you need out of that call. And here's what I mean, because I've been through it. I had this just like strange psychological belief that I was like being unreasonable with the things that I was asking. I wanted things done a certain way. I wanted the agenda done a certain way and the list done and the email filing system done and newsletters. Like everyone has opinions, especially if you're founding a company, you have opinions and you will find that you're perpetually dissatisfied with the relationship that you have with an EA if you yourself fail to communicate your preferences on how you want things done, right? So like Nicole yeah. and I have a, a standing joke. It's highlighted at the top of our daily sync agenda. It's called OCD AF, <laughs> right? Where we just, we know that we want to be super detail oriented. Emails get linked in the list. And we like, we have a whole thing, right? I got a 15 page manual on how to be Matt Verlax EA. But like, man, we get, we got over that in a week or two. And, and now it's like, like lightning, right? And so I think it's just, you have to be the person that is comfortable enough to have an opinion that you ask someone else to do yeah. the thing the way you need it done, or you're going to feel like having an assistant is slowing you down instead of speeding you up, but it's actually not going to be their fault. It's going to be your fault. Right. So yeah. I think that's just like a, a core belief that some people have to get over. Cause I had to. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, I think you, we under index sometimes we see because we call it as an executive assistant and it's primarily administrative tasks. We think that this could be somewhere where like, it's just where you delegate the task and it doesn't really matter who, who that person is, but like you really are, what you and I are talking about is a, a real partnership with yeah. an executive assistant that goes way beyond the administrative work. Like it's a, a lot of co-creating strategy and, you know, anticipating the need. What we want is in few words as possible, can that person anticipate where we're going and help us get there faster? Or yep. you receive a, a task and you know, receive a, an, an issue and be able to go solve it and know the same values that you have and, uh, you know, how you would solve it, how you'd view it and and go do as good or a better job than 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 you would have if you were on the issue like you're we're, we're cloning your capacity in the organization through that relationship and so it's got to be somebody you like working with like man i, I think I, I made that mistake earlier on i had i hired people that were great they had the skill set but i just didn't love like jamming with them 
yeah. like and, and and just enjoy the the company and the conversation and like i think that wears wears on you so yeah it shows up in a lack of trust but it also is like if it feels like work talking to that person that's not good you got the wrong person man yeah 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 agree so dude i love all that i think what like to button this up for ramesh like everything on his list right email calendar gifting organizing offsites dinners all of that is in the admin bucket so like everything on that list to me is table stakes right so if you're in this position you've made the commitment to hire someone start by sharing everything start by documenting how you want all of those things done because if you don't yet if you haven't documented your opinion on how what the end state looks like you don't be surprised when you don't get what you want right and get all of that done. But to me, mentally, I'm allocating roughly 50% of this person's capacity to those type of things. And if I've hired the right person, I've got another whole 50% to work on project management and, you know, being making decisions on my behalf and strategy and gut checking what I'm working on and all that kind of stuff. So I mean, that's everything on that list is half the battle. And that's the caliber of person you should hire for. Yep, yep, 100%. Um, yeah, I feel like tactically, how to push into the strategic. Um, there's this great framework Dan teaches in Buy Back Your Time called the 10 So oh, let's favorite. just say that you yeah. were pushing into, like I, I could say like putting together a founder's dinner. That's gets not into strategic, but it's not purely administrative. Like there's a lot yeah. of details in there that you probably have preferences around. You love for that, you know, EA to be able to, to tackle. So 10810 works like this. Let's just say that it's a founder's dinner. You want to put together a dinner of six founders in your local area and you need their help coordinating, you know, pulling the whole thing off. You want to show up, have dinner with some really cool people and you know, want your EA to tackle all the rest. The 108010 rule would be you meeting for the first part of that project and talking about you're involved for the first 10%. And this 10% is dedicated to defining what the end looks like what you know how what are the constraints what's important yeah. is there a budget who would you like to be there you know any you brain dump as much as possible this is what success would look like and they get a chance to ask questions what about this what about that whatever you do a discovery up on the on the front end then they go and do 80 percent of the work there may be some you know, depending on the size of the project and the stakes you may engineer some other like touch points along the way but they go do 80 percent of the work and then when it's time to go you know deliver this product or the dinner is supposed to happen you're involved for the last 10 percent, and you you make you're you're there to help calibrate the final final pieces before it gets shipped but um i think that 1080 10 is a great place it kind of builds in the calibration of like communicating the preferences they get so you know some uh some freedom to go do the work how they would want yeah. to to learn and then you get to come back and that last 10% is there to learn. And then every time we go through a project where we use a 108010, they're understanding more and more of the decision making process that you have. And, uh, you know, it gets easier and easier to the point where like, I, you know, I'm now with, with Mia, man, I can, I can just say, Hey, Mia, can you just go fix that? Like whatever that thing is, can you just get in and go fix it? We'll talk about it, but like, just run to the fire and yeah. we fought enough fires together to where like, she does it just as good as I do. And, uh, and sometimes yeah. even better because she's got some like great administrative and project management skills that, you know, I don't, I don't possess. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I was laughing because I've literally used some of the similar turn of phrase with Nicole where I'm just like, can you just make this go away? Make this just <laughs> solve this problem because I don't want to keep talking about it and it yeah. always gets solved the right way. So yeah. 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 Ramesh, make the hire. Let us know how it yeah. goes. And yeah. have high yeah. expectations, like hold a very high standard. I will tell you this to land the plane. If I were starting another SaaS company tomorrow, my very first hire would be an executive assistant before yeah, a support yeah. person or a salesperson or a marketer. Like I, if I'm having a co-founder, cool. First real hire though, like first employee, executive assistant in a blink, 100% certainty, period, full stop. Yeah. Like it's that important. Yeah, it is. Yeah. We could, we could honestly, man, this would be a fun episode. Maybe we'll go do this, but this would be a fun episode. If you are w trying to work with an EA and you're having some issues, like just to do like a, a maybe we should even bring our EAs on. That's what I was thinking. Do a little, yeah. uh, you know, first off, like you get their perspective on it. But then second, 
maybe we should do a little, you know, live coaching. And uh, if you're working with the knee and have a hard time getting over the hump, like we can, you know, help diagnose. It's helpful to be, I'll tell you, it took a lot of figuring out. Like it wasn't, you know, we're making it sound easier now than it is helping you. Yeah. Hopefully the goal of this conversation is to give you a picture of the future of what it can be so that you keep on pushing through the uncomfortable learning stages to get there. Like don't yeah. just settle for a VA that like, you know, half, you know, you could essentially like, give you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, man, I don't know. Good, good question, Ramesh. Hey, what's up, guys? Johnny here. Hey, if you're anything like me, some of your favorite podcasts have come from the recommendations from a friend. And so I'm asking you a quick favor today. Will you share this podcast out with someone that you are building with, a SaaS founder that you know? Matt and I are, hope, are on a mission to help as many SaaS founders as we possibly can. And you're sharing this podcast with me in the world to us. Thanks. Yeah, it's a good place to land. Cool. All right. Going on to number two from Jeff. Um, he was asking about, does anyone have a someone managing a Facebook group or a community for them? And so... It's a pretty high level question, but I think it's a really powerful strategy. And, you know, Johnny, we were riffing on this before you hit record. You know, we were talking about tackling it in two ways, right? Because I think you can use communities, whether it's a Facebook group or, or a different type of community for like marketing and lead generation. And then you can also use it um, for your customers. And so I've done the latter, but I was hoping maybe you can kick us off on some thoughts around leveraging a, a community for lead generation for your SaaS company. And then, uh, then I'll pick up on the other side of the fence. Yeah, so I, I'm going to go more down the, the path of like using a Facebook community for lead generation, uh, uh, delegating this to someone else. I think we've, you know, we've talked about the process of, of delegating yeah. anything, you know, uh, frequently, or maybe we'll just set it aside and do a whole separate episode, but like of utilizing a community in the lead generation process, you know, I think this is whether it's, uh, you know, and I wouldn't, I don't know if Facebook would be my first pick could depend on your target audience is that like, I'd say, yeah. Hey, where's my audience hanging out? And then how do I create the community um, where my target audience is hanging out and I play facilitator. So my, you know, and this falls under, I think it's a great strategy for providing value to your target customer. First, you can do this through education community is just another a way to deliver okay we're playing connector we're helping people help each other facilitating a, a meeting place for people who have shared goals and challenges and then from there we so if that that's the value you're creating i'm going to think through how do i facilitate great discussions let's just say um i think i don't want to pick an easy one let's pick an example here um Let's say that you serve contractors, building contractors, right? And you figure out where are they hanging out online? Where are they asking questions? And we're going to facilitate some conversations that are going to be beneficial for the community. So I think first one, step one is create engagement and activity, make it valuable for that, uh, for people to join. And then two, you create resources. The way I've seen this leverage for lead generation is you create a resource. You would create a post that would say something like, Hey, I've created the contractor's guide to getting paid faster. Reduce your accounts receivable from on average 90 days down to 45 days. I got a quick guide. If you want it, type, you know, 45 days below and I'll send it to you. And you're using the community to, to have people raise their hand. And then you take those conversations into direct messages where you say, yeah. you know, you're given the resource and then you ask, Hey, what brought you here? What's the biggest challenge? And in a perfect world, that lead magnet ties very closely to the solution that you provide and you turn that into a sales conversation. So um, absolutely seen it done, done really, really well. Um, I think there's a ton of benefit to owning the community itself and yeah. um, you can use it for all kinds of things. That's how to use it for lead generation, but you can use it for, you know, client discovery um, for, just you know, getting feedback. Like sometimes we just need a sounding board, and to go find people that aren't using your product, that are in your network, like you own the community and provide a lot of value there. It gives you some some goodwill to further some of those other initiatives. But um, man, that's what I've got. I think you know, Matt, you you have a, a a lens a little bit more on the the client support side and some experience building a support community yourself. Yeah, so it's a really it might feel like semantics, but it's really important. Um, what I did, which I believe, at least through my eyes, is the best practice is I didn't use the community for support. And I was very deliberate about that. Even when I talked about the customers and like taught them how to show up, 
the the community was almost a feature of being a customer, right? And so we were very particular about how we leverage it. I'll get into specifics in a minute, but the the table stakes here is if you have crappy support, you're not going to be able to pull that off because if they're not happy with the responses that they're getting yeah. through email or chat or whatever, <laughs> the, then they're going to start posting about it in the group. Yeah. So like yeah. you have to be good at supporting your customers first before you do what I'm getting ready to tell you. And so like, and we, my first company, man, we monitored our, our CS stats like maniacally. I mean, from our NPS, but also like our time to first response on live chat, our time to ticket resolution, our, you know, individual support case, customer satisfaction. I mean, and we had some pretty world-class metrics because we really gave a shit. Um, and so, you know, that was who we were. And so like, let's assume that you're good and you're happy with your support. What we did in that group is we used it. So we were serving gym owners, right? We used it for like strategic customer oriented conversations. So we would share best practices. We would share client wins. We even did um, for a long time, webinars just geared towards the staff members of the gyms, not necessarily the owners who were the people who were purchasing it, right? We we split our NPS and we realized that the staff members were less happy with our software than the owners were. And so we started doing webinars specifically catered towards the team members of the owners, right? And we were able to close that gap on the data, but also we used the Facebook group for distribution on that, right? Because we knew that the users of the software were in the group. And so we really tried to use it to shine a light on which customers were getting great results through strategies that were deployed via our software and how to help these people get better at operating their gyms. And so like we, it was a feature to be in there. If you stopped being our customer, you got kicked out, right? So it was only for current active customers. Um, and we, we had a pretty like hard line on it's not for support. And the way that we educated people around that is like, if you're trying to figure out how to accomplish something in your business using the software, all good. Like post in the group, rock and roll. There's probably someone else who's figured it out. If it's like my little blue button's not working or what's your response to my email or like, I need you to go look at this one particular contact inside my platform. Like if it pertained to something specific about your account, it goes to support, right? So if it's like general, go in the group. If it's specific, it goes to support. And everyone like, everyone was on board with it because nobody wants to be cruising around like a public stack of help tickets, right? It's just not fun. Yeah. Um, but if you, as long as you got the help stuff figured out, it was a crazy effective way to increase usage and increase customer satisfaction within our active customer base. Um, so for that purpose, highly recommend but it's got to be managed, right? It's yeah, got to be managed. Totally. If you suck at support, it's the it's the wrong thing to do. Get better at support first. I mean, honestly, to, to answer this question in general, if you are not inclined, like community is not like a, it's not a growth hack. You've <laughs> got to. It, it requires continuous investment. It can be incredibly rewarding, and it's very hard to reproduce. Like yeah. easy to turn on ads you know, easy to reproduce and in pattern match, hard to create a community. Like if you have, a, if you are the person in your space that owns the biggest community, I mean, I think, you know, we've put a lot of time into every Facebook groups, uh, Facebook group for SaaS founders only. I think I've got, I don't know, we're like 40,000 members. Somewhere. I don't, I don't know. Exactly. Don't quote me yeah. on it. Hopefully it's not, I don't know. Maybe retract that. Out. I don't know exactly how many, how many members we have in there, but we put a lot of time into building that up. It's not yeah. a like, you know, it's not a, it's not a growth hack. It's not something you're going to do overnight. So whether it's on the support side or on the lead generation side, it is going to take effort. And I think it's, you know, choosing selectively. And then if you do it, just commit and create, a, you know, great community guidelines, invest in it, um, you know, provide value first. And then over time you can figure out how to extract value out of it. But um, yeah, I, mean, I think great jam on, on the community front. Yeah, I do. You nailed it on that last bit. Like a community done poorly will be much more damaging than a community not done at all. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't make yeah. an entry level hire and chuck it over the fence and hope it works and checks the box. Like, just don't. There's a great book if you want to kind of like, uh, I like reading a book in the category uh, first, or maybe even just if you want to invest a little bit more time, um, you know, find a podcast. Um, I think there's a book called The Power of Community. His name is David. Is it David Skinks? I'm pulling it up right now. I'm terrible at uh, typing and talking at the same time, but I want to get this recommendation out there. David Brooks, is that what we're talking about? The Power of Community is the book. I'm almost 99%. David Spell, positive. The Power of Community. 
Maybe. There's a blog post. I don't know. A lot of Davids out there. That's not it. <laughs> I'm going to find it. I'm going to find it. It's going to be podcast great. teams have to clean this part up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Let's see. Anyways, we'll get the God. What is the name of the book? I must have. Uh, I have it sitting on my copy. Oh, table. I think you threw me off with the David. How's Howard Partridge sound? No, that's not it. No, well, shoot. No, he's got a, we'll he's drop got it a in the show notes. Power community. Say that again. I said he's got a book called The Power of Community. It was funny. All right. Well, good talk. <laughs> David Spinks is his name. The book. That's what I said. Did you? No. <laughs> Come on, man. Don't, don't. It's hard enough for me to type and think, let alone be like, you know. I don't know. The business of belonging. Wow, that would help. If I had said the right name of the book, that would help. The business of belonging. He talks about six different areas of the business to leverage community. Everything from like, you know, client advisory groups to uh, lead generation to support to um, affiliates. Like there's, it's a really solid overview of leveraging community. The guys just worked for 20 some years on uh, on building communities and businesses and has now had you know there's very in very few organizations is there actually like the a person that owns community it's like mm-hmm. this side thing for you know the head of marketing or the head of support or whatever and more and more putting a person in you know these you know in, in larger companies at scale that owns community and express in these different areas so it was a good good overview of counting the cost of what would it take to like do community well and i would say unless you are really thinking about it and kind of obsessed over it and think it could be great and a competitive advantage i'd probably just like not do it (laughs) yeah yeah johnny i just followed my rule anytime anyone recommends a book to me that i think would be remotely interesting it's an automatic buy it's on my kindle in the time it took you to explain that so nice sweet cool Yeah, that was an awesome, uh, awesome question from Jeff. All right, question three from my man Matt. What a great name! Um, so he he was referencing a video from Dan Martell, who and and Dan in that video had talked about the concept of a ten x developer. Um, you know, also saw it in the Netflix book, No Rules Rules. And so Matt's question is, what does a great developer look like, and how can you see a great one versus a good one or an okay one, right? And so this will be an interesting question, you know, because, you know, Johnny's a non-technical founder. I'm a little bit more on the nerdy side of the house, so we can answer it from two different perspectives. So, uh, yeah, JP, why don't you kick us off, man? Yeah, this one is, you know, there's two, you know, two, I guess, issues to be aware of for this particular hire as a non-technical founder in that one, we're looking for what 10 X looks like. So that's the question is like, what would 10 X look like as a developer? And then two, we're hiring for a skill or for a role where we don't possess all the skills. Like so you sometimes have this, this cheat code. If you've done sales before to hire your first salesperson, you know a little bit of what you should be looking for. You don't have that luxury when you are a non-technical founder hiring a developer. So I'm answer the question through both lenses of like, you know, what would I be looking for for a great developer? And then what would I do to make sure that they had the skills so they weren't just a person that I liked and enjoyed talking to, um, but someone that could actually get the job done. So first off, what's a great dev? I'd say there's three things that I'd be looking for. The first is this is per- a person that cares tremendously about the mission like from the second i told them what we were working on they couldn't stop thinking about it and they have tons of ideas around it like they are they immediately become obsessed and potentially could care even more than you care about the product you got to see that from day one this is a 10x person this is not just a job they are thrilled and obsessed with the mission, the customer, the problem, the ways we could solve it, et cetera. So if I'm not feeling that from day one, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, you know, I'm going to keep on looking. I haven't found the 10 next yet. The second would be that they have strong recruiting power. And I don't mean that in that they're the person that's going to be hiring or the person recruiting themselves. It is that other people will want to work with them. Mm-hmm. they're impressive other people like they are developed like high performers want to work with high performers your technical team should be giddy about the prospect of working with this person because they are so good and they have so much to learn from them if i'm not seeing that in the hiring process of like dude 
Dave is unreal. Like yeah. we got to get Dave on the team. And then I'm hearing like, though that would be the, I may not be able to have the same appreciation because I don't code, but other people who do have got to be telling me that this person is absolutely incredible. So you have strong recruiting power. Um, the third thing that I'd be looking for is that they ask really great questions. They would challenge my thinking and they've got strong opinions. If, if those, if they check those boxes, this is like, this is someone who is driving towards something. They know what great looks like. They're going to take initiative, take ownership. Um, they have a strong opinion on how things should be done. Those are all things that I'm looking for. If in the hiring process, I'm finding those things, I probably move on to the second stage where I go like skills, you know, this, the second question that Matt asked was like, how do you find them? Yeah. And, you know, I'd say I'd hire a recruiter, like no doubt I'm hiring someone. I'm hiring, You're talking about a 10 X developer. You're trying to get the top, you know, 5% of the market. Um, you, you're not, those people are not applying for jobs most of the time. Um, they might be applying for jobs if they don't know they're a 10 X developer yet. You might luck out every once in a while hiring, like, you know, entry level, mid-level people who are just coming into, you know, the prime of their career. But if they know they're a 10 X developer, they know they're great. They're not looking for jobs. So got to work with the recruiter. 10 X developer is going to pay for themselves 10 times over. So swallow the pill, you know, worry about having to pay for a recruiter. It's well worth the cost. The second thing I do is I hire a third party to validate their skills. I'm going to find someone else that I trust who has worked with 10 X developers before. And I'm going to say, Hey, can I pay you for your time to be part of the hiring process? Here's what I'm looking for. Here's what I'm worried about doing. Yeah. I'm worried about hiring someone that like I'll talk. No, you know, no follow through uh, or doesn't have the skills. Can you be a third party that will help me validate where they got the skills? And then last, I'm going to engineer some kind of group interview or test project to make sure with, with my technical team, like they got to work with my team before they work with the team. Um, and I'm going to figure out some way for them to actually work on something together. And if I get through all of that and I feel like they're a 10 X, like I'm making the hire. And from there, it's you know about managing a top performer of which we've, we've had conversations on, on the podcast before, but yeah, man, that's how that's, you know, my, I made a quick list of what I do. If I was going to go solve this problem, I'm curious from someone who's got some technical chops and work with the 10 X developer or two, what would your process be? Yeah. So my process for evaluating, you know, who your 10 X developers are, my process for figuring out the best developers, there's three components to it that I look at when I'm working with someone. And some of them are, it's interesting. It's almost like a continuation of your answer because some of the things that I'm going to run through, I don't think you can fully flesh out in a hiring process. So let's say you go through everything that Johnny, that you just laid out and now you're working with someone like that process of evaluating this person's efficacy on your team continues, right? And so the way, like the three different levers that I look at, and I'll explain each one, speed, quality, and context, right? And so I'll talk about each one because there's some nuance for each. Quality is the most obvious, right? Like we can't be, we used to joke in my last company, say don't ship garbage. That was like our engineering team, you know, playing around core value, except we were serious, right? It's like, you can't, you can't, chuck some shit over the fence that's going to break and cause a whole bunch of bugs and piss off your customers and slow things down, et cetera. Like things are going to happen. I'm not saying you expect perfection, but we need to maintain a really high bar for quality. And on the technical side, once you have customers, this is not like getting your MVP to market, in which case you're just literally sprinting. But once you have customers you need to protect their ability to use the platform, it means things like writing code that is backwards compatible with what you already have in production, writing code that's well tested, has automated tests to back it up so you're not re, you know, reintroducing bugs, um, you know, things of that nature, like making sure that the, the work that this person is shipping is of adequate quality where it's not going to cause more problems than it solves. So like that's lever number one. If you picture it like on a continuum, speed is the counteracting force to quality, right? It's like when that old joke when you're hiring an agency, right? It's like you can, you know, pick cost, quality, and speed. You get to pick two, right? Yeah. Um, and so, so speed is the other, the other side of this. But, you know, the question wasn't about like acceptable software engineers. It was about 10x software engineers. And so when I say speed, there's not some mythical benchmark where if you do x lines of code which is like the dumbest measure of anything ever right in in a certain amount of time like it's it's very relative but for you if you're an engineering manager or a technical co-founder you're you're looking for the holy shit moment right the quality is not negotiable 
And then once you see the qualities there, you're looking for the holy shit. I can't believe Johnny built this in a day. I thought it would take two weeks, right? And it's actually really good. And I know it's good because I used it as a user. And also I can see that it's backed up by tests and it's technically sound, right? So it's like quality is the bar that doesn't move, but the 10X software engineer is also impressing you with the speed at which they can achieve the quality. It's not as much of a trade-off as it would be with a more typical engineer where it's like, I can do this fast, but I'm going to do some crappy work, right? So they can hold the quality bar higher while also moving faster. Um, and it should be shipping oriented, right? Speed. I'm not talking about like, look at me, I did all this work. Like they need to be focused on actually shipping code, right? Into production, into the hands of the customers until it leaves the building. It doesn't really matter all that much, you know, from a, from a customer standpoint. So they also need to be of the mindset where it's not just about, I'm going to build some behemoth, you know, piece of work that's going to take six months behind the scenes, right? Very rarely is that actually the right move. Typically it's more iterative and we're going to, you know, ship in smaller chunks and get user feedback and, and put it in the hands. So it's how quickly can we ship things into the hands of our customers without sacrificing quality. So that's that continuum. The third builds on top of what you said about like mission and just like being oriented to the business. I just call it context, meaning like, can they read the play of the business case? Like what I don't want to hear, what I wouldn't expect yeah. to hear from a 10X engineer is like, well, that wasn't on the, the ticket that product created. So I didn't build it. Like look around the corner a little bit. See yeah. what you think is going to happen. Have the conversations, like be able to understand like the business application of the work that you're doing, not just, uh, you know, the product person said, I need to do this thing that does one, two, three, four, five. So here's your one, two, three, yeah. four, five. Goodbye. Right. Like yeah. it's you're not a order taker. That's not a 10 X engineer. It's a person who can read the play. So 100%, so that's the context. Yeah. So like the quality bar doesn't move, have a surprisingly fast speed to actually ship it out the door and not break stuff and be able to read the play on the context. If those three things are true, keep that person in your world as yeah, long as you possibly yeah. can. So Dude, that's my view on it. hundred percent, man. I couldn't agree more, especially on the last one. Dude, just the number of times that we've been across the table from a founder who spent a shitload of money building the wrong thing. Yeah, it, it's sad, man. And I think that, that having the person with the with in the especially for a non technical founder, having the person on the technical side safeguarding against is this really what we need to build and at the right time? And is there a simpler way to do it? And, you know, helping instead of just like saying, hey, more hours is more dollars for me. I don't care where they're pointed. Yeah. You know, being invested in where we're going as a company, man, to me, that's, I think, uh, especially in the early days when you're, you're hiring your first, you know, three to five developers, you know, having the people with high give a shit is, is pretty important. Amen, dude. There's one other thing that I got, I can't do this justice without saying, there's one other thing I got to call out on this, like the whole concept of 10 X, right? You have to be 10 X of something, right? Like 10 times better than X, right? And so like, this is a relative journey as your company progresses, right? Like a 10X engineer at Netflix or Google would be like a 10 billion X engineer to some bootstrap startup, you know, that's doing 20 grand a month. And that is okay, right? So when you say like, get a 10X engineer, you're probably not going to take the best engineer at Google who's making, you know, a million and a half dollars total comp every year and get that person to come like work at your startup, right? But what you're looking for is for each hire to come in, like you're looking for the person that's 10 X better than what your current ceiling is right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like, especially when you have your first hire might not even be the right one, or maybe you get lucky and it is, and they're, they're getting you on the market. The next engineer you hire should be someone smarter than the first person that was writing code for you. Like, and yeah. the next person you hire should be smarter than them. And this applies to everything, not just engineers, but like, you know, 10 X implies that X has a value too, right? And so you're just trying to find the person that's an order of magnitude better than what your current quality bar is. And the more mature your company gets and the higher you can pay people and the more you can enroll them in the mission and the vision, the higher caliber talent you're going to be able to attract. So like, yeah, don't compare yourself to Netflix if you're a three person company, because you're just going to make yourself sad. Just yeah. find the smartest person you can get at the time, build high give a shit factor, high mission alignment, and then every person you should hire after that should increase the talent density and bring up the overall IQ of the technical team. You do that, you're in a good yeah. place. You make the 10X hire is going to make the current ceiling the new floor. Amen, dude. You got to keep, keep on doing that over and over again and 
growth will growth will happen so dude yeah. hell of a journey through the uh through the mail room i feel like we had some bangers today um yeah man, if you down. know yeah dude this was this was this was fun johnny how do people put a question into the mail room oh man you should email us at podcast at sasacademy.com we'd love to riff on them we have thoughts and ambitions of doing i think we will do one um so pay attention you know stay tuned to We'll at least do one live show like this where we'll actually bring founders in, answer questions live. We'll probably you know grab a couple of our SaaS Academy coaches or thought leaders yeah. from the space and jam along with us. But you know, hey, if this is where it's starting. Send us your question at podcast at sasacademy.com. And uh, man, if you're liking these episodes, let us know. It'd mean a ton. Just drop us a review, send us some feedback at the email. Yes. Um, Matt and I are having a ton of fun doing this, but we have fun doing a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff. Uh, if it was just about having fun, we'd probably go out, you know, take a hike, go work out, but we want to help you. And if this, these are helpful or they could be more helpful, I'd love to get your feedback at podcast.academy.com. Cool. Awesome day, dude. Appreciate right. you. Talk to you, brother. Later. <laughs>